All right, we have uh, two-time uh, pro bowler and uh, former Jags defensive end, Jason Bavin. Jason, thanks so much for taking time to come on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. So, um, Jason, I want, want to jump right into your, your, your college career here. I was doing some research. You, you grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and then, uh, you know, you were playing high school ball your, your senior year. You, you break your leg, but then you come back and you play the final three games of the season, and then you end up getting a scholarship to Western Michigan. Um, is that true? Is that how it went down? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. The, the last three games weren't pretty, I'll be honest with you. It was uh, it was not a full full speed, uh, Jason, that's for sure. I mean, that must have been a hell of a recovery. I mean, you know, having a broken leg and then coming back and, and playing your last three games. How did you do that? It was pretty much a, a cast on my leg. Um, but I was just, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, I played and I was healthy and I was good, you know, good to go. Cause junior year, there was all these schools that wanted me and then I broke my leg and they're like, well, we'll see. And so I'm i uh, I'm a pretty stubborn person. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, that, that, that is amazing, man. Um, uh, you know, you, you go to w- Western Michigan, you, you earn a bunch of awards. I mean, uh, as a defensive end, two, two time Mac defensive player of the year, uh, two time first team, uh, all Mac, um, and then you get drafted by uh, the Houston Texans in the first round in 2004. Uh, was playing in the pros always kind of in the plans for you, or no? It, it, re- it really wasn't. I mean, um, I tell the story is uh, I think it was uh, my sophomore year summer. Um, coach Darnell, my head coach at Western, called me up to his office. And for those people that know Coach, he's got a, he's got like a Southern accent. He's like, oh, Jason, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something right now." He's like, you want to do this? You can do this. You got it. You got to be all in. You, you you got what it takes. And and I remember leaving his office and there's an elevator going out. Oh, he's in the third story, you know, the stadium. I remember going down the stairs thinking, holy crap, like this guy's not bullshitting me. Then literally from that moment walking on the stadium, I was, I, I already always worked hard, trained hard, did all the right things, but I was, I'm like, I'm all in. I'm going to do whatever it takes. No more spring breaks, eating better, working out harder, training, just, just, just absolutely getting dialed in. And uh, that's just how I how I stayed, you know, till uh, till I retired. Yeah, he was a great coach and, and great advice. <laughs> um, so you know, you go you go in uh, in t- the 2004. You, you you know have the combine, um, and then as you know, this year in the 2021, um, there wasn't there wasn't any combine. It was canceled. Um, yeah. Do you, do you see the NFL? going forward with that kind of format with just pro days and, and um, just analytics, or do you see them kind of still having value in the combine? Well, I was never a huge fan of the combine and the grand scheme of things. Um, because to me, your, your resume was your tape, but the good thing about the combine is you get to spend time with guys and find out their character. And for those teams that really adhere to a, a certain culture, and they have a very specific mission, vision, values, and belief, which isn't many. Um, it's good because then you can decide like, hey, this guy may check some boxes from a physical standpoint, from a performance standpoint, but is, a, is he the kind of guy that we want in our locker room? Because I think the uh, locker room culture is something that gets the first thing to go when uh, they're making the draft day selections. Yeah, and I mean, that, that's got to be nerve-wracking. You know, must have been nerve-wracking for you as a player because – you know, you have the 40 yard dash, you have a bunch of different, you know, exercises, bench press, you make one mistake and that could ultimately affect where you go, right. Or where you get drafted. So, I mean, I imagine that was pretty well, nerve wracking. I, I got it. I got to explain to you this way. Alphas, winners, people that are at the high level, they, they, that's not how their brain works. They don't think about making mistakes, <laughs> Yeah. you know? So it's, uh, I wouldn't say it was nerve wracking. I mean, you, you prepare and, and, and you prepare and you're ready to roll and, and, uh, and, and you go. You don't, uh, you don't really think about it like that. So I would imagine there would be months of preparation, right? For that one. Oh yeah. I mean, I was down in uh, cherry Hill for, I mean, you know, three months just preparing for the, um, uh, you know, for the combine, uh, working out and drills, you know, training, working with sprint coaches at, up at Princeton. And there's just, uh, there's a lot of nuances too of the, of, uh, the drills that can, you know, really affect your performance. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Um, you know, when I was I was I was looking at you know your career your highlights you were uh, a great pass rusher aggressive flew to the ball uh, I was just kind of curious over the span of your career who was the best tackle 
or offensive line that you went up against? Uh, I would say Walter Jones, hands down. Okay. I mean, he was uh... – he he was by far the best tackle. I mean, I feel like if you beat him, you're like, oh shit, it's a screen. You know, it was it was one of those things. I mean, he's obviously a Hall of Famer. Yeah, but yeah. Um, just play. just smooth, large human. I just knew exactly how to punch. He might shoot inside hand, outside hand. You know, it wasn't. He didn't make many mistakes. That's for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Jason, I'm sure you get asked about this a lot. This is one of the Jaguars moments that kind of sticks up in my sticks out in my head is the uh, when you were playing the Cardinals with um, with uh, Andre Ellen, uh, Ellington. You you tackled him. You you accidentally tore out one of his his dreadlocks. Um, and I was just kind of kind of curious. What was your initial reaction to that when that happened? Um, well, I didn't know they were in my hand till <laughs> till the end. You know, okay. and then I. Uh... You know, I, I might have played it up to the crowd a little bit at, at the at the after the play. So. <laughs> okay, but so, uh, I mean, when you're when you're on the field, you know, that's that's one of the, the great things about football is you can you can just be that person that um, you're really not allowed to be in uh, you know in society and uh, get rewarded for it. Yeah, did you catch a lot of flack after that? Did he say anything to you after the game or after the play? No, no, there was. I mean, it was just you know, it was a heat of the moment situation. I yeah. mean, if anything, I just. I'll be in the airport going to different offices, you know, people will see me and they'll be like, yes, he ripped his dreads out. High five, you know? So, uh, but that. yeah, I mean, I'm, I always wondered, um, you know, pi, you know, the pileups after a play or it's like the scuffles I've, I've heard, heard stories that, you know, there's uh, a lot of, uh, you know, punching and stuff, kind of crazy stuff going on. You know, if there's like a fumble and there's a pileup, uh, is any of that true, you know, based on your experience or, um, well, I would say it's a lot's changed. I mean, the NFL is obviously much softer, more politically correct. I mean, it's really, really not almost. I mean, what it was last, I would say, uh, CBA. Um, I mean, it used to be, you know, a man's game. Um, and now apparently, it's I don't know a lot of other things. Um, but uh, there was punching, there was fighting. I mean, I could, you know, we could go back to games when I was in the Eagles play against the giants. We'd, we'd literally have fights and then no one get rejected, you know, maybe <laughs> fine later, but you know, now everyone's going to get suspension. They're going to talk about it and their feelings. And it's just, it's just a, it's much different now than it was then. So there probably isn't at nearly as much uh, stuff going on in the pile. Yeah. Agreed. Um, you know, you played for a variety of, uh, you know, different, teams throughout your career you know you played for the uh, Philadelphia Eagles you played for the Texans uh, the, um, you know the the Ravens um, the Seahawks I mean you played for some great coaches like Mike Holmgren um, you know uh, John Harbaugh Jeff Fisher I mean Andy Reid did any of them leave an impression on you you know as a as a player I mean they all left their mark in different ways I mean because I, I would say that there's a, you know, for, especially for guys, especially for professional athlete guys, there's a, for some of us, there's a, a slower maturity rate, you know what I mean? So for them to kind of, uh, to see the, the value and, and the, have the patience sometimes, you know, um, you know, it was one of those things where I wish I knew now what I knew then, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, and now looking back, you know, it's like, and now that I'm, I coach a lot of youth sports in high school, um, it's like, I know that they don't know, but they'll know in the future. And I think that's with their perspective. Like, yes, I know you're acting like a dipshit, but you'll get it. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. They, okay. they definitely all had an impression on me in, in a good way. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, after your pro career, you, you, you started red zone realty. I want to talk about that a little bit with, with former Jags uh, teammate, Kyle Bosworth. Um, were you always, interested in real estate or was that something that kind of happened following your, your, your football career? No, I um, have a company that started while I was still playing. Uh, we, we build neighborhoods, we build apartment complexes. Um, uh, and I wanted to have something to kind of frame that up, you know, more of a, um, a storefront. So that's where the, the real estate, the real estate side, side came from. So we could, we buy, we buy land, we develop it, we build in the infrastructure, we build homes, apartments. So I wanted to have a, a vehicle in which, I could get access to better deals. That's kind of how it started, you know, for my own projects, for my own investments, my own, uh, you know, buy and rehab stuff. But then it's morphed. I mean, I mean, now we have, uh, 
four offices, two franchises, and we're going to roll out this, you know, this fall, our, our big franchise, you know, to the, to the public um, model. So it, um, it definitely didn't start there. It started from a, I guess, uh, I want to grow my portfolio um, perspective. And then I realized like, as we brought on agents that wanted to come work there and hang there, hang a license there, it, it, it really involved into, um, I guess, a, a labor of love in the sense of, like our, our big um, uh, slogan now that we're rolling out for, for this year is, is Red Zone Realty, where agents become business owners. Because we have, we're all about training, we're all about coaching, about culture, and very specific um, what we want in the sense of people that are that want something more, we're going to help them get there. We're going to help them build it. If they're at selling $2 million a year and they want to get 10, we're going to do that. If they want to start a team, we're going to help them build a team from a, how to structure the admin, how to structure the transaction coordinator. And we've had tremendous success with people have joined red zone if, if doubling tripling and just having this this explosion of growth and it's it's really due to them committing to the idea of always getting better and doing whatever it takes and and obviously the culture surrounding them with all the other people so it's it's not what i'd planned master planned but it's what it's evolved into and now it's to me it's it's invaluable you know in a sense of when you see people's life change you see someone that's like man I'm, I'm trying to make it real estate and then all of a sudden they they have a team they have four agents underneath them they you know they have a, they have an assistant and it's like yes this is where i wanted to be and it just it, it's, it's pretty awesome i'll be honest it's uh it's, it's probably the best feeling of you know close as you get to you know the football field yeah and i love the name red zone red zone realty that's a great name so kudos for that um great marketing there and i i, I can imagine like you said just kind of starting something like that and then seeing it grow it, it's got it's got to be satisfying i mean it's got to be yeah, for sure. You know, it's, there was a lot, a lot of times a label of labor of love where, you know, when we started, I was wearing, you know, 20 different hats. You know, now we have inside sales people, we have coaches, we have administrators, we have, you know, all the different people. But when it started, it was like, I had, I, you know, wearing a lot of different hats was uh, putting a lot of hours. So it's, um, it's definitely feeling, feeling, feeling better now about the situation. So when you were playing, uh, you know, you, when, when you're in the league and then you were, you know, towards the end of your career, was there any planning, you know, is there any planning in the NFL? Do they provide any guidance on what to do after the NFL? I was always curious about that because you see, you know, sometimes players, you know, end up, you know, going broke or not, you know, having kind of a plan after the NFL. Is that something that, that, that they kind of a service they provide or was it just kind of, you have to figure I mean, it they, out. They offer some stuff, but you got to be self, you have to be a self-starter and self-motivated. And they, there's plenty of avenues for guys to take advantage of different things. I mean, if you look at what most guys do now, most guys are in medical sales or they're own a gym or they're somehow in fitness or they're sell, you know, um, you know, in the financial world, you know, portfolio stuff, you know, there's real estate. There's, there's not a lot of, you know, avenues that they i guess we fit into you know the boxes for the most part um but it comes down to i mean i, I think and there's a lot of guys that i help with this transition you know to this day and i'm um, going continue to will continue to help um like what do i do next you know i'm like listen let's figure it out what, what you're going to do or what you want to do like even if you have money like you have to if you're a man you have to have a purpose you have to have something that gets you up every morning you know something your, your kids can look up to your boys, you know, your daughters, you know, like, oh, dad gets up in the morning and this is what he does, you know, and just to have a, a functioning, healthy lifestyle. Um, but the biggest thing for guys is it's it's almost uh, it's a, not a I hate to say pride or ego, but you go from being, you know, top of the world, every door's open for you. And then you want to get into an industry where you might have to be an intern, you know, a 30 year old intern making no money because that's what you got to get into. So you got to, you got to, you know, swallow your pride and, and, and do this. And it's a, it's a hard thing to, to do, you know, going from an, the NFL or any sport to, to do that. Um, and you got to be willing, willing to, you know, put the hours in because no one's going to do things for you anymore. So there's, there's some unique challenges, but um, the NFL does offer some, some vehicles. If you, if you choose to use them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sounds like you got it. Like you said, be a self starter and be able to kind of swallow your pride, which is a tough thing. To and do. honestly, you know, and like I said, you know, this is, I, I talk honestly with the guys, even the guys that, you know, I talk to the, you know, maybe some of the young rookies that we take care of, or, you know, talk to the team, like, listen, take advantage of now you know, relationships you build now are the ones you're going to, you're going to want to lean on when, when you're done, because doors don't open as, as easily when you're not on the field anymore, for sure. Gotcha. So 
uh, you know, like I, like I said, you had mentioned you had, you had played for a lot of different teams. Um, you know, I know there's the, there's the connection with, with, uh, with Kyle and, and red zone, uh, a realty, but what was there, what was the reason that brought you back to down to, to Jacksonville, Florida again? Well, I, we didn't ever, ever leave after I got um, traded here, you know, didn't, you don't really have a choice when, when you get, um, uh, traded to a team. Um, well, I uh, technically waivers, but um, you go to the team with the worst record. And uh, truthfully, I tried to fight it because, um, you know, at the end of my career, I obviously wanted uh, the Super Bowl ring and be on a playoff team. Um, but the community here, the people, uh, the weather, the the lifestyle, the culture, everything really checked a lot of boxes for people that, that live that lifestyle with a family, with kids, their goals are motivated, they're healthy, they, you know, want, you know, that's what they want in life. It's a, it's a really unique um, setting, and that's I think that's the real part of the reason why a lot of guys end up living here that, that come here. I mean, it's not a place where you would say, okay, when I retire, I'm going here, but it's kind of getting to that place because a lot of guys stay. I mean, there's, we have a great alumni group, and not just, not just football. I mean, there's a lot of other sports guys that, um, that retire here and live here. Yeah, and I imagine there's a lot of excitement with, you know, Urban Meyer – you know, becoming the head coach of the Jaguars, a lot of development projects uh, being talked about, um, real estate ventures. Uh, h- how is it down there right now? Are people pretty excited? Or Yeah, there's, there's definitely a buzz. You know, I mean, Jaguars really, you know, they kind of competed against the college teams for a long time as far as, you know, people go people go on Saturdays to the game and then they're kind of were spent for Sundays. But it's, it's, really, um, it's really becoming kind of part of ingrained. I mean, nothing like, you know, the – teams that are on for a long time, but it's definitely getting a lot better. Okay. Okay. Well, Hey, Jason, uh, thanks so much for doing this. I really appreciate, uh, you know, you coming on the show and, uh, talking some football, talking some Jaguars. Um, you know, I, uh, want to thank you again and I wish you the best for, uh, you know, your future endeavors and, uh, with red zone, red zone realty. All right, man. I appreciate it. Duval! What's up, everybody? It's Andrew from the Jaguar Podcast. Hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, there's more content over here. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, as always. And remember, this is a podcast, so you can find this pretty much wherever you find podcasts. There I'll be doing interviews of current and former Jaguars players, including Joe Schobert, uh, Dewan Smoot, Shaq Quarterman, etc. And I also do interviews of former Jaguars players, including Natron Means, Jimmy Smith, Tom McManus, etc. So be sure to check out the podcast, subscribe to it, stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy, go Jags, and I'll see you next time.